Here we have Paul McDougall, Solutions Architect with Bitmovin. He is going to be talking about, I should just read the screen, Managing Transition to HEVC VP9 AV1 with Multi-Codec Streaming. I know that's something that everybody can use right now uh, as we take, go through the transition. And one of you will be walking out with a Fitbit at the end of this session. Take it away, Paul. <laughs> Hey guys, thanks for everybody for laughing at that. Uh, my uh, new boss is here, so you all have to clap and laugh at the, uh, the right times in here so I uh, don't get fired. <laughs> great start, great start. Um, so for a uh, show of hands, how many of you guys here are using any codecs besides uh, HEVC, or rather uh, AVC uh, H.264 right now? Is anybody moving past anything like that? Nope, all uh, H.264 crowd, cool. So, um, you know, for the past uh, few years, we've kind of been in a really nice space in the industry in terms of the, uh, the video codecs itself. Uh, we've really been able to use uh, H.264 pretty much everywhere. Uh, it means that, you know, all your browsers, all your devices really have that consistent target. Uh, and there's been a bit of a mess in other parts of the industry, things like, you know, HLS and Dash being kind of uh, incompatible. Uh, DRMs have been incompatible, uh, and the market started to move towards, um, you know, kind of common uh, media application frameworks uh, and uh, common encryption standards that have simplified those. Uh, and of course, as soon as that starts to get settled in and starts looking like we have a strategy there, of course, there's a whole mess of spaghetti that has to go uh, open up, and uh, that's where we're kind of uh, getting into now, into the, uh, the multi-codec world, where we're trying to move past those uh, sort of earlier versions of the codec with H.264 and move into some of those next generation technologies. So let's go take a look at the, uh, the current state of the industry and some of the history around that. Um, okay, cool. So uh, if we look back, uh, you know, that time since basically 2003, uh, up until uh, very recently, uh, that's really been the only uh, mainstream option out there. That's what all the browsers have had support for. Um, <clears throat> starting around uh, 2010, we started to see some new codecs emerge into the space. Uh, VP8 was one that was uh, started by a, a smaller company out there that uh, Google acquired and then started uh, bringing that up. And really the reason for that was they wanted to uh, separate themselves from some of the concerns around the intellectual property uh, that go on with some of these codecs that are produced by groups that have uh, uh, patent pools and so forth around them. So they kind of tried to bring themselves away from that uh, and bring a more efficient codec to the market too. Uh, HEVC is uh, another example of a much more efficient codec. And this was meant around some other needs besides the intellectual property stuff that we saw on VP8. Uh, really, this was about um, reduction in bandwidth for things like the mobile market uh, and uh, being able to support larger video sizes, things like uh, uh, 4K uh, and 8K, uh, as well as uh, higher bit depth video, so video like HDR and so forth, which are not part of the original specifications of the uh, uh, H.264 standard there. Um, but uh, HEVC, uh, as great as it is, has its own sort of um, encumberments to it. Uh, mostly those are encumbrance around the intellectual property laws, uh, rather intellectual property uh, there, and the licensing associated with it, which has still maintained uh, a bit of a gray area in the market. Um, we're not really sure what the final price and structure is going to look like uh, for uh, H.265 HEVC, uh, and we're hoping that that's going to settle in a bit. Um, and the reason why we might see that settling in is because of uh, some development on the other, uh, the bottom end of this uh, uh, chart here. Uh, codecs like uh, VP10 and AV1, uh, which are uh, similar advances in terms of their performance. Uh, so the reduction in bit rate, the ability to support things uh, like uh, higher bit depth video, so your HDR videos, as well as your larger frame sizes. Um, and those are uh, sponsored by this group, the Alliance for Open Media, uh, which has promised to be uh, royalty free uh, in the market. And that's put some pressure onto the, um, uh, the HEVC group, the, um, the MPEG LA, uh, and uh, so forth to try and get their kind of, you know, the act in order around that, make sure that we have some clarity and some understanding of that. So we still have to see what those kind of uh, issues boil down to. Uh, but in the meantime, I think probably a lot of people here are interested in seeing some of the, uh, the technology implications of this. So uh, kind of moving past some of these um, uh, initial issues here and go into that. Um, so the support is really one of the big challenges here. It's these new codecs, whereas the old one pretty much supported all our environments. So uh, all the major browsers out there, uh, Chrome, uh, Edge, Firefox, Safari, as well as uh, iOS and uh, Android devices. Uh, and then we look at some of these newer codecs and we see that we have some more uh, mixed support for that. So uh, we can see here, for instance, uh, HEVC is really only supported by the Microsoft Edge browser uh, and the uh, Apple Safari browser, as well as uh, iOS devices with the most recent version uh, of iOS, iOS 11, and then the uh, uh, High Sierra uh, operating system. <clears throat> VP9, uh, which is a similar competitive codec to uh, HEVC, and that's the Google-backed one, 
Uh, we can see support for that primarily around Chrome and Firefox as well as the Android devices. Uh, these two codecs have pretty similar levels of performance. We'll get a little bit more into that in a moment. Uh, and then AV1 is really the one that we're seeing as being a, a lot of potential for it. Uh, obviously, you know, it's not uh, in the market yet, but uh, the promise of it is very, very high, and there's a number of reasons for that, uh, including its support from broad industry uh, resources, so uh, both on the software side in terms of uh, companies like Google and Microsoft uh, and uh, to a degree Apple, uh, and then on the hardware side from companies like Intel, uh, NVIDIA, um, AMD, uh, and uh, ARM and all the other chip makers out there that are going to give us some, uh, some hardware uh, deceleration or acceleration for those decodings there. Uh, and then most importantly, uh, probably down on the bottom here, we can look at that royalty structure. Uh, now, uh, H.264 has not really had much of an impact on the royalty side of it because uh, the groups around that didn't really commit to uh, collecting royalties. Um, but there was always that kind of uh, cloud looming over it. Uh, HEVC, on the other hand, ha has a much stronger kind of uh, royalty implication behind it, much stronger intellectual property implication behind it. So uh, that has really hampered that adoption there. Uh, and VP9 being backed by Google and AV1 uh, also have the um, royalty-free, or at least they've been promised to royalty-free uh, in the market. We'll see what that ultimately settles down to because there is always the potential of some, uh, you know, patent mixing going on in the market there. Um, but we can go through and uh, take a look. We've also did a, a survey on this, rather, to see what the um, uh, uptake is on these codecs. Uh, so currently, this is what we see in the market right now, uh, AVC uh, H.264 being uh, really dominant, of course. Um, H.265, uh, HEVC moving in much more into the market there. Uh, that's really been spurred on a lot by Apple's support for that, uh, with the support for iOS devices, of course, being a, a target for mobile, uh, really benefiting from that efficiency improvement. and then. Um, the 4K TVs, of course, requiring a more advanced codec than the usual uh, H.264 there. VP9 getting some uh, uh, bigger support, too, from Google, uh, although the main use cases that we see in that is um, Google-supported properties like YouTube, um, which really drive a, a huge amount of the, uh, the market footprint, of course, there. Uh, AV1, kind of surprised to see, actually, some of our customers saying that they're uh, using uh, AV1 out there. Um, most notably, probably the biggest user of AV1 actually in the market right now is Facebook. Uh, they do a very small amount of their video that's encoded to AV1. Uh, and we get into some of the challenges why it's not uh, quite practical yet uh, in a moment there. And I'm not sure what the other guys got going on here, but maybe there's some interesting codecs that some other people in the market have been touching on. Um, moving on here. So plan to use video codecs. Uh, now we're definitely seeing a lot more pick up on the, uh, the AV1 there. Uh, and of course, HEVC being so well known uh, and having a lot of the mind share in the market gets uh, probably the most attention there. Uh, VP9 a little bit behind that, uh, a little bit ahead of AV1 too. So going through then, the real reasons why we're looking at this codec value, of course, as I mentioned, the uh, support for HDR, 4K, uh, the bandwidth efficiencies for that, are really letting users have that higher quality uh, experience over the same connection that they can have. Uh, and then, of course, uh, for many operators, the reduced storage costs that you get around that, by having those smaller files on your uh, origin storage, on your CDN, you're going to have less bits to uh, keep around. Um, and of course, if you get into those larger codecs or those larger frame sizes like 4K uh, with a greater bit depth, those are going to have uh, substantially larger files, so you really do need to have that uh, kind of efficient codec to deliver there. Um, and we can take a look at what some of that efficiency uh, looks like in the real world. Um, so some of the uh, research that we've done around this, we can start out with uh, uh, H.264 there in the middle of the, uh, the image on the left side there. Uh, we can see about an 8 megabit 1080p is our reference point. Uh, we can compare that then to VP9 uh, to 1080p. We get similar visual quality at about 5.6 megabit. Uh, and HEVC uh, is somewhat more efficient than that, getting a uh, similar visual quality at about 4 megabit. So about half that uh, bandwidth spend that you get uh, over uh, H.264. And of course, that also lets you reach uh, your mobile users, your users on uh, lower speed connections with that higher quality end user experience. Uh, on the right here, uh, this is a chart that really uh, shows you what the efficiencies are like on a, a broader range of uh, bit rates uh, and a, a broader range of uh, PSNR values. Uh, for those not familiar, PSNR is perceived signal to noise ratio. It's an attempt 
at a uh, quantitative metric for determining what that visual quality is. Uh, there's a great deal of debate in the industry. In fact, there's, uh, I'm sure, a whole bunch of people out on the, uh, the show floor over there that could get into all kinds of very uh, religious arguments about what metrics are uh, most appropriate there. But conversationally, PSNR is a really good metric to just kind of talk about uh, what we see here. Um, to help you guys understand this a little bit, uh, looking at the bottom of the chart here, this is the bit rate in uh, kilobits for a video asset. Uh, and then this is the perceived quality over here. And what we can do is we can take a look at uh, H.264 here being this low curve here. Uh, and then we have our codex, for instance, uh, HEVC in this gray line, uh, VP9 in orange, and AV1 in blue. And what the goal is with any of these codex is to try and make this curve as far as possible to the left. That means that you're going to be getting values that are the highest visual perceived quality for the lowest bit spend there. So uh, what we see here is there's quite a separation of these next generation codecs from uh, H.264 across these metrics here. Uh, and uh, when we get up into these uh, higher bit rates, even more dramatic uh, separations out there, which is going to be critical for those uh, 4K, for those HDR workflows that are really going to be uh, letting you reach those audiences on those, uh, you know, the fancy new uh, 4K TVs and so forth. They want to see all that best content in. Um, so again, let's go take a look at what our support is like on these different devices here. So, uh, of course, uh, that HVC, uh, having that limited footprint there um, with those browsers, uh, and VP9, uh, again, not covering everything. Uh, but when we get to our usable footprint here, we actually see a much better penetration and much better available addressable market here. Uh, so because Google is such a major force in the industry, that VP9, which is uh, today, gives you access to more than half of the market here. Uh, there's also a degree of overlap between the uh, HEVC as well, since some devices do support both of those. Uh, but that means that today you can actually go and make some significant savings with that VP9 codec and with that uh, HEVC codec now uh, that Safari has uh, expanded that reach into mobile so much. Um, and then have the catch-all for uh, H.264. So some of the challenges that you're going to run into in this uh, are particularly relevant on the encoding side. Uh, so a lot of these next-gen codecs uh, are very difficult to encode. Uh, AV1 in particular is extremely challenging to uh, encode, although it's getting much more efficient. Uh, as an example, uh, at Bitmovin, we did a, um, a live stream of uh, AV1 at 1.5 megabit uh, a little over a year ago, uh, and that took 200 cores to do that in real time. So it's not an architecture that you can really uh, deploy uh, in a, um, a, a modern uh, environment. But that's improving quite significantly. For example, we also got that down to 32 cores much more recently. Uh, and that's going to continue to move down uh, even further as the, the codec becomes really finalized and it's really able to be optimized for it. Just to be clear, that 200 cores was on a very early version uh, of the codec. So it has lots of debug code in it. And it's you know, not really, uh, by any means, a market-ready product at that point. Uh, we are getting much closer to the point that that's a market-ready product. And it's something that we can finally start really focusing on optimizing that and making that much more efficient. But uh, given today, it's a really, really challenging thing to do. So that's not something you really want to do for every asset. Um, and then you have to really calculate out what benefit that's going to have to you. So uh, let's go take a look at um, what that do, do, do. Uh, encoding decisioning. So this is really where you have to go make your uh, choices about this based upon those uh, challenges of those demands of that encoding, how much it takes to do that, the replication of your assets. Uh, you have to figure out what is the right choice for the assets that you have, what's the right choice for your business model. Um, so things to look at are, for instance, uh, how likely is it that an asset is going to cross a threshold where it makes sense that the efficiency of these new codecs are going to give you benefit? Um, is an asset uh, likely to do that uh, already, or is it something that will do that? Uh, and then you also want to make sure that the decisions that you've made are valid decisions, that these are uh, things that are going to let you, um, you know, really benefit your business, that they're not just kind of theories uh, that are going to potentially improve it. You want to see that actually happening. So the way to do that is really with analytics. So analytics are critical here. Um, as we showed you on some of the earlier slides, there is a, a broad you know, difference in the different devices that support these different codecs. Uh, and different customers, different uh, sites, different media properties have very different audiences. So it's important to use an analytics tool to understand what your uh, audience is like. Are they predominantly Android devices? Are they predominantly users who have a Chrome browser? Or maybe they're uh, iOS devices, maybe they're Safari devices, perhaps they're all OTT 
uh, you know, Apple TV users or something like that. And all of those devices are going to have different support for different codecs in the market. So you're going to want to use that as one of your first uh, metrics to look at when you determine uh, what your encoding profile is going to be like. And then the next part that's really important here is making sure that you're using that right now, because some of those codecs are really computationally expensive, that you're using that on the assets that are going to make uh, a big difference. So uh, content that's going to go viral, that you think is going to go viral, that's a good piece of content that's likely to uh, benefit from those more advanced, more efficient codecs. Uh, then, of course, you can also monitor your library continuously, see what uh, assets are crossing that threshold after the fact. Uh, perhaps you're looking at, for instance, an uh, initial window when you upload an asset or release an asset onto your properties. Uh, if you see a certain velocity of popularity for that asset, that's a good indicator that you might want to uh, very quickly dispatch an encoding job uh, to your uh, encoding farm or whatever uh, resource you're using for that into one of those other codecs so you can, uh, again, benefit from that. You want to make sure you do that as soon as possible. So it's important to uh, have your analytics be as close to real time as possible so you know what uh, that content is doing, know how to uh, make those encoding decisions there. Um, and then you have to measure those metrics in the end. And so some other challenges that we run into uh, are the playback challenges here. Uh, so things like selecting the right asset for those environments. Uh, you know, again, going back to the point of this uh, inconsistent support across different devices, uh, you have to know, um, you know, what are you going to serve to that customer. Uh, and then you also have to know how you're going to configure your player for that. Uh, and these can be particularly challenging if you're doing something statically configured. So uh, what we recommend doing for that is, oh, sorry, uh, give your player uh, everything. So instead of looking at the user session in advance, doing something like detecting the browser version, what we recommend doing is querying the browser's capabilities with your player uh, in the, um, uh, a browser environment. Uh, this is a much more efficient technique than trying to look at the user agent, uh, parsing the user agent, which is a technique that many people employ today. Uh, and based upon that user agent, they will go uh, and decide uh, what um, asset to configure that page at uh, before that page is loaded uh, or during the loading process. But the, really the best way to do this is to go ask that browser what it is capable of, uh, what that device is capable of, and based upon uh, those answers that you get from that device, uh, then go and select one of those assets that you might have already pre-configured that manifest that has uh, both that H.264, that HEVC in it, that VP9, uh, and then uh, from that pull in the right asset to go play back that most efficient delivery mechanism there. Um, so those are really, I think, the key points to understand uh, about delivering a next generation codec here uh, and what you need to know uh, in order to make sure that you are addressing your audience with the best experience they can have and then, of course, uh, making the most efficient business model that you can out of that. Uh, at that being said, uh, I'd love to answer any questions that you guys might have uh, around uh, the next generation codecs. All right. Who's got some questions for Paul? Come on. You've got some smart questions before, and here we go. So you mentioned about the AV1 and your player being used on mobile and uh, on the browser platforms. Mm -hmm. what, how does the smart, uh, TV platforms uh, tie to the AV1 and your players itself? That yes, that's a, a great question. Uh, in particular with AV1, that's something that we're seeing evolve quite a bit right now. Um, Smart TVs are a really challenging environment to deploy into because there's varying degrees of commitment to the device manufacturers of really supporting those feature sets. Uh, one thing that we've seen for certain is there's really good support for uh, HEVC on smart TVs at the moment. Um, and that's one way that we potentially see the market breaking out is that these more kind of uh, traditional ecosystems like set-top boxes and some of those closed ecosystems might have better support for HEVC. And then you might see on the web browser, the more open market side, better support for AV1. Uh, of course, at the end of the day, the really important part there is that you have hardware acceleration for decoding in those environments. A lot of smart TVs are actually very underpowered devices. They don't have a robust general processor in there, and they rely heavily on hardware uh, acceleration to decode uh, those particular assets. So uh, the smart TV doesn't really have a lot of software uh, decoding power, but it relies on those uh, application-specific circuits uh, to go do that kind of decoding there. Um, so. When we see companies like Intel and AMD and NVIDIA and so forth adding support to their product roadmaps there, that's going to be the crucial step in order to make sure that you can deploy that into uh, those smart TV environments. Uh, so hope hopefully we'll get uh, some good support from 
uh, you know, the manufacturers of those smart TVs to go uh, access those features, because they'll have that in their chipsets there. You know, most of the chipsets will have a broad variety of hardware uh, decoders in there. They just need to enable those features and then make sure that we can decode that video in those environments. All right, we're big fans of Bitmovin, and I think uh, Paul did an awesome job. Round of applause for Bitmovin. Thanks, <laughs>